2017, the best cases around the world. Okay. MUFON. So they always put out the, like their top 10. You know, you made it. in the woods. They definitely thought a lot of wow. what you captured. And well, you did a good job investigating, Dave. Third phase of Moon, Blake Cousins. We are with Rob Freeman. He specializes in atmospheric anomalies in regards to UFOs, CE5, contact with these interdimensional beings. What are they? What's going on? We have incredible videos that we're going to be sharing throughout this interview with Rob Freeman. They've been capturing things that are unexplained. And right now we've got Rob on the show. Welcome. Hey, Blake. Thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. Well, let's just get straight to it. I, there's some of these incredible videos and I want to get to this one where it looks like a massive orb. What were you guys doing out there at night? It looks like this orb basically banks behind the trees, doesn't make a sound whatsoever. Any idea what this possibly could be? What were you guys doing out there? Yeah, we had been invited to go see Charles Lamoureux. Charles Lamoureux films a lot of orbs. He's uh, got a channel out in uh, Vancouver, BC, Canada. We got invited out to see him on the first night we set our stuff up in one of the parks in Vancouver and we caught a few little things in the uh, thermal vision and, you know, kind of your garden variety stuff, right? And, uh, you know, some flashes in the sky and so on. And I think the second night we were at a different place and then the third night it was going to be raining in Vancouver and uh, we said, well, where should we go? And he said, why don't you go up the coast to Britannia Beach uh, there's an old mine up there. Maybe there will be some strange things around the mine. Sometimes there is, as you know. Uh, so we actually drove up there, and uh, he decided that he would stay back. He said, I'm going to veg out. It's going to be raining, and, you know, I'm not going to go up there. So we went on our own. It was Marcus, Mark McNabb, Liz uh, Rodriguez, and myself. And also Breslin Martin was there. And we went up to Britannia Beach, and we went to where the mine was, and we didn't have a good feeling about it. Uh, we stopped in the local gift shop, talked to the ladies there, and we kind of said quietly, you know, do you ever see anything around here? And then they said, what do you mean? Well, lights in the sky, anything odd? And they said, not here, but if you go about 10 minutes north to Squamish, they see orbs all the time. And we said, what do you mean? Well, they said, there's, a, there's the Squamish chief. It's that big monolith stone that you see in the video and they said orbs have been seen above that on several occasions she said if you go there and find a spot and just park for a number of hours you're, there's a good chance you'll see something so we drove up there the rain was kind of starting to thin out a bit and we thought maybe we'll get lucky it will clear and we set up the camera we found a spot uh, we went around the roads uh, and found a spot that is a town called Squamish BC it's a tourist town on the way up to Whistler, B.C. Uh, we did find a spot sort of in a logging road where there's a clearing. And we had a great view of the Squamish Rock of the Chief. And as you can see, there was a view also of the, you know, the continuation of the mountain with the trees and so on. We really had a strong feeling we we're going to see something. And this is something that comes. We've been doing this for four years now, this CE5 stuff. And... You do get a good sense. It's not right all the time, but I'd say a good 90% of the time. If we get that strong of a sense, then we definitely see something out of the ordinary. Anyway, we were set up, and uh, as you can see in the, the movie, in the clip, Marcus and Liz were set up, you know, driving theater style in the, in the back of the truck. President was over on the rocks doing a meditation. I was setting on my cameras. I set up time lapse and so on. And these, it's one of these things where you, you do got to spend a lot of time, Blake, and be patient. People that think they can just go out and look up in the sky and see something, maybe some can, but most, you're going to have to spend the time. And, uh, you know, and do things like get yourself relaxed, you know, do some CE5 protocols, whatever. Anyway, we were filming, and I had turned my cameras off to change batteries and so on. And I had turned my cameras back on, but not recording at this point, because we were kind of standing around talking, and it was around, I believe, 10.59, I have to check, p.m. And Breslin, you know, I was just talking to Mark, and I was about, you know, two feet from the WMD, Weapon of Mass Detection, or debunction. And Breslin pointed over, and she said, what's that? 
and I look over and I see this silent light moving, my first instinct was to look in the night vision on the screen and move the tripod, move the, the, the rack of cameras so that it was square in the night vision. And the rate of speed that I saw it moving, I was having to move the tripod and my split second thinking said, are you gonna chance turning on all the other cameras or just shut up and film what you got in your night vision right here? And I opted to just stay with the screen and film it with the night vision. And it only lasted 10 seconds, as you can see, and I'm so glad I did. Many people have criticized me for, you know, having all that equipment, like it's over $100,000 worth of equipment. Yeah, sure, this video itself made the top MUFON sighting, I think, in 2017. People were fascinated by it, and I'm sure everybody was on the ground excited. We could hear the people on the ground just amazed by what you captured. I got it. Oh my gosh. Oh. What the hell? It's in the woods. Good job on the 10 second uh, fast response to capture whatever it was. Now let's get to this one because this one really is strange to me. You guys are out in Cloverfield. Out in the fields, there's some kind of orb beaming and you have your friend actually run out there and try and make contact. I mean physical contact. This uh, must have been a hair raising experience for you guys to see this orb so close to your friend. Yeah, so Dan is moving his way out. It's right in front of you, Dan. It's about 30 feet. Oh, now it's moved to the right. It's moved to the right on the right side of the, the electrical pole. Saw it on the ground, about closer towards us, towards the pole, about five to six feet. Where? Hold your right arm up so I know which way you're facing. Thank you. He heard something. Yeah, he said he heard something. Gas. So he thinks he hears gas pumping through the ground. Yeah, let me let me give you some background on the Cloverdale spook lights or the Cloverdale earth lights, they call them. There's a fellow by the name of Wyatt Cox who has who lived there and who has been studying them for 40 years. He wrote a book on it. You can buy it on Amazon. It's the Cloverdale Spook Lights, I believe, Wyatt Cox. And there's another fellow involved, Rich Hoffman, from the Scientific Coalition of UFOlogy. And he's got a group of scientists that study UFOs. Well, he, he was there um, with us that weekend. So was uh, Wyatt. And there were several other guys. There was Dan Erickson. There was uh, Mark McNabb and Liz Rodriguez from our group. Uh, there was Alan Saulnier, a friend of mine that I brought down with me. We were all there. And the story on these lights are, it's probably, I'm going to say 95% a natural phenomenon. Uh, there's something in the, the geophysical arrangement there um, the tectonic plates, the sulfur in the ground, the, the magnetic lines of field, it kind of lines up into a perfect storm, very similar to the Hestelin lights. And by the way, we've been there three times and spent a lot of time with Erling Strand, the scientist as well. But anyway, we were looking for the typical lights that occur in Cloverdale. And they're usually about an eight to 10 foot orb. And uh, Blake, if you're ever in the mainland states, you should go down there and spend time. I mean, you will get film of it. And if you do spend the time, and, and it's really a fascinating thing. But the typical orbs go from the east, they come up into the sky and they go from the east to the west at about 20 miles an hour. And they'll come back too. But when they come back, they're kind of dissipating, they're broken up. And they get, uh, they can get more orange. So they're kind of yellowy orange. They'll get orbs that are more orange, that you'll get some red orbs, and they've even had blue ones. And the blue ones go faster. The yellow ones are more, they're typically about 20 miles an hour. And then the, the blue ones, I'm not sure, but they go, they go faster. This particular road, many people, they stopped in and saw us. We were there for a whole week. Um, they stopped in and saw us. We talked to them. We we did interviews with people who had seen who had seen these orbs. Uh, there are stories of orbs sitting on a person's front yard and rising up and moving. Um, 
You know, many people say, is there a knee T component to it? Possible, because there's other stories. Um, uh, Wyatt was telling a story that for a while, every night at 9.08 exactly, they would see an orb appear. First of all, how is that, right, at 9.08? But it could be something to do with the 24-hour day, the cycle of the Earth, whatever. So I could accept that maybe that's a natural phenomenon. But, you know, in the fall, when the time changes, uh, by an hour, the orb showed up at 9.08 under the new time. So this is a true story. Uh, there's a railway track not too far from this location. And him and his partner, Greg, that have been studying these for years, they saw a big ball, a sphere, uh, hovering near the railway track. And they said, let's wait and see what happens when the train comes. When the train came, uh, and as it got, the locomotive got close to the orb, the orb coupled with the train engine and moved down the track until it was out of sight from their view. So would you say it's ET or, you know, the scientists would be more likely to say that it's, um, that there's a magnetic effect to the iron and steel, the massive amount of steel in the locomotive, and the fact that it was near the track to start with, you got a long parallel set of uh, you know steel lines. So you know, is it ET? Don't know. Uh, there are scientific people that are studying this phenomenon. We've gotten quite involved with them. Uh, I've got tons of footage. Uh, the week we were there, I've got eight cameras, two are time lapse. The other six are video. And each one is on for literally eight hours. So I've got six times eight hours, 48 hours of video every single night. And, uh, you know, we just got back last Monday and I'm still going through all the footage. It'll probably take me a few weeks. Sure. Well, let me ask so, you, let me ask, ask you this, because we're looking at the video. It seems like this orb, it's not a random and natural thing, in my opinion. This thing seems, this orb seems like it's playing with the person out there in the field kind of playing yeah. sneak sneak so, yeah i gave you some background specifically specifically getting into this particular incident it was raining that night and we were set up in uh larry peden's garage he allowed us to be on his property for the week and we were out more on the front lawn right by the road but this particular night it was raining so we set up in the carport and alan said and we had seen something the night before we had seen like a white half orb out in the field didn't get video of it because my cameras were facing in the wrong direction by the time i ran over it was gone but alan said because of what i saw we saw last night he's going to take the car and go to over to the road and sit there and see what he can see so i was out in the uh, i was in the carport further back he was out on the road and he saw a light and uh, in the beginning of the video, you hear me describing where we are, and I'm just showing around. And then I cut in his video. Now, he filmed 24 minutes of video, but I just took the highlights and, and pieced them all together. Now, it's really odd, Blake, because is it, is it, you know, is it live or Memorex? We're, we're, we're completely analyzing this thing because... On one section of the video, you see Mark McNabb, our producer, walk in front of Alan, and the orb seems to be between him and Mark. So, but why is it that when, when Alan turns the camera around, the orb is in the same spot in the field, and if there's shaking of the orb, uh, it all goes with the field. It doesn't go with the camera. So we're really kind of scratching our head on this one, and there's a lot of research to be done before there's any kind of conclusive results so is it some kind of a reflection in the lens of the night vision or but then why is it moving completely in sync with the the, the back like the four you know that what you're filming out in the field like the telephone pole dan out in the field or is it some kind of a phenomenon where you know the light passes right through somebody so it's really, really, really odd. And, and um, I don't know if you're on my channel, but that's the video down where it's, you see the tree flash. Did you see that one? Yeah, we see a, a video that you took and did some enhancements and you see some kind of reflection of light on the tree and the clouds itself kind of repeating yeah. itself. 
Yeah, there's no enhancement there. All that is is time lapse, and I've taken two frames of a time lapse. So it was time lapse photography with infrared. So uh, it's an infrared filter, and then it's set for black and white. And um, during the course of the night, during uh, two frames, that tree lit up. And in the next frame, it's partly lit. In the next frame, it's not. And in the previous frame, it's not. So literally, probably, it, it overlaps two 30-second time exposures. So it's probably, I'm going to say, maybe a 20-second event where the tree lights up. Now, the far trees light up. The sky lights up over on the right-hand side. And the trees in front of that house light up. And it's very brilliant. And we've now got the scientists over at the... Uh, SCU, we're actually um, mocking up a full 3D Google Earth thing to try to pinpoint was there a light source externally? Because these orbs literally can blink on, they can go off, and it can travel along that road and go out. So we don't know if this is a case that an orb went by that tree and lit up, or there was an orb out in the field, potentially, you know, by that uh, electrical pole that you see in the other video. We don't know. Uh, on stuff like this, you've got to kind of study it. I've got many other videos where there's other views and stuff, so we're, we're going through all of that. It's just fresh, like this, as you can see, the dates are just recent. So, um, you know, is it ET? Don't know. But it's, it's more likely a natural phenomenon. Like, I'm gonna say, you know, 95%, but cannot rule out the ET. Well, you know what, Rob, we've been sharing your videos and I see that your channel has some videos up there and we want to have our audience check out your channel. Can you tell our audience where to find you, Rob, your research into these atmospheric anomalies and uh, everything else about your program? Sure. Uh, my personal channel is just YouTube and then Rob Freeman Atmospheric Anomalies. It's a long one when you type it out, but it... You know, it should come up. Um, we're also involved in a project, a documentary. The documentary is already produced. We actually screened it at the um, Star Wars Symposium that Paula, Paula Harris puts on in November every year. We just screened it. That's in Lachlan, Nevada. Um, we've been traveling the world for four years. Uh, we've been to uh, 11 countries and over 30 cities. We've probably interviewed a couple hundred people. Um, and we're, we've produced a documentary. We're producing several more. Uh, everything from, you know, on the Heston Lights to all our CE5 experiences. It's called Making Contact Be Inspired. And the website for that is mcbiproject.com. So Making Contact Be Inspired. So it's just mcbi project.com we also have mcbi expeditions.com so we've been traveling the world some of the expeditions we put on we invite people to come along some are more private we've been on expeditions with the famous six topaz wells we've been on easter island with him for a week and we caught many things there i've got some of them i believe on my channel there uh, we're going to be going on an expedition to peru with ricardo gonzalez and paola harris um, uh, we've been, uh, we're going on an expedition with Costa Macrias from ET Let's Talk. Uh, we've, uh, let me take a look at some of the other places. We've been to Mount Adams with uh, James Gilliland and so on. And we've got some neat video there of the orbs in the top of the mountain. But we're, we're going around the world. Uh, the goal is to make contact. We've already had various levels of contact. Uh, from, you know, strange things in the sky to even a possible interaction with uh, an ET being on this earth. I had a, an interesting thing that happened in Australia. Um, we don't know for sure, but, you know, you hear stories of people, um, you know, meeting possibly ETs and how they don't fit in. Like, for example, a fella showing up at a picnic with a suit and tie on or you know, certain people, they don't seem to fit in. You ask them questions and they don't quite, they're not with it. I compare it to be like maybe in the, you know, World War II, the United States might hire somebody who's of German descent, who's lived in the United States for 30 years, train them, send them to Germany to be a spy, 
But if somebody spent too much time with that person, they would figure out that they're not from there. So what you're Even saying, though, you're actually saying that there's a possible spy, some infiltration into the group, possibly uh, MIB, may I say? Uh, well, not into our group. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is we were on a sky watch, uh, Lauren Kurt from Australia and myself, and we were not far from Ayers Rock. And we had a fell. we were one o'clock in the morning off the highway out of sight. And it was strange because about one o'clock in the morning, a car pulls up right into that spot. And this is hundreds and hundreds of miles of nothing, just scrub and a straight highway, right? And this fellow pulls off the highway and literally comes right to where we were. And I thought that was odd. I thought of all the places you could pull off, first of all, how is it he came right to us? Uh, Lauren was nervous and she was nervous about all my equipment and I said I'm gonna go over and talk to this guy and you know I mean I had my laser in my back pocket that wouldn't be any match if he had a gun or a knife but still I had my laser in my back pocket and uh, if I had to use it um, you know if you live in the States you have guns right <laughs> but anyway uh, this guy he got out of his car and he was friendly but he was really tall I'd say about, you know, six foot eight. And you often hear about these beings being so tall and Nordic looking and stuff. He was a handsome guy. He told us, but the whole, everything he said, I wouldn't say it was a monotone voice, but it was more almost pre-practiced or rehearsed or he didn't fit in is what I'm saying, Blake. He, um, he was saying that he had driven from a mine 18 hours north and he was going home and he was, he was driving non-stop and for somebody who had just come from a mine 18 hours before his shirt looked like it was pressed or just taken off the shelves at the clothing store his clothes were clean and when we asked him what he was doing there in the spot that we were he he was gonna sky watch he said so I mean, there was more to it than that. Um, he could sense that Lauren was uncomfortable. I wasn't. I had the feeling that this guy was an ET. I really did. But Lauren was nervous that maybe he was going to steal our stuff or whatever. So she was giving hints that, you know, we kind of like our privacy. And then he politely said, if you'd rather, if you'd rather that I go somewhere else, I can do that. But, but it, the way he talked, he did have a, a Australian accent, but the way he talked was not the way a normal person would talk. Like you and I are carrying on with inflections in our voice and different things. It wasn't like that. So he left and then we stayed through sky watching right through till when it became light. And then we were on our way back to the uh, hotel resort. And I was, you know, we're down the highway 30 minutes and I've got my indicator to turn left. And Lauren says to me, did you see that car that just went by? So literally the car going by back to where we were. And I said, no, I wasn't paying attention. She said, that was our guy from last night. And I said, what do you mean? She said, that was him. And I thought if he was going home, where did he stay overnight? And why is he going back in the direction he came from? That seemed really odd. So I turned the car around immediately, and by, by the time I got it turned around, and this is a straight road that you can see like literally 10 miles down the road, I didn't see him. We drove all the way back to our site, and I was, you know, driving at a pretty high rate of speed. I won't say the number, but uh, we never caught up to him. So, you know, was that guy in ET? I'm sure you've read lots of stories, interviewed lots of people about all these kinds of things, Blake, but was he an ET? I don't know. If I had to put the chances of it being, of him being an ET, I would say it was 90%. Oh, wow, this um, it definitely sounds like an MIB encounter to me. I think they're following you around, Rob, and basically you gotta keep up the good work. You gotta- MIB, right? A friendly MIB. There you go. Yeah, he just wanted to see what you guys were up to, and uh, I'm sure 
what's going on with the CE5 and what you guys have been experiencing and the new information you have and you're about to release. It's going to be an exciting time coming up in 2019. We're going to be supplying the links so everybody can take a look at Rob Freeman's research, his work in regards to the atmospheric anomalies going on. It's all below in the description. Rob, thanks for joining us. We're going to be keeping in touch with you, man. That's great. And thanks so much for having me on your show, Blake. Really appreciate that. Absolutely. And if anybody out there does CE5 or they got video cameras that are capturing things in the skies, be sure to submit it to us right here at Third Phase Moon. We want to see your videos. Rob, thanks so much. We'll see you again next time.